Uh, hello, Foreign and Fingments viewers. Uh, I am uh, Rob Farley from the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. Um, and with me today is David E. Hoffman. He is the author of The Billion Dollar Spy, A True Story of Cold War Espionage and uh, Betrayal, which is just, I'm going to start off by saying it's just a fantastic book, a fantastic read, and I recommend it for everyone. Hopefully you'll be, hopefully you'll be even more convinced of that by the end of the conversation. Um, anyway, David, how are you this morning? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Oh yeah, no, we are we are delighted to have you this morning. So, um, if we could get started with, um, could, you, could you you know recount sort of the basics of the story of Adolf Tolkachev, like who he was, what he did, um, and you know why why this book came out now and why it's important right now. Tolkachev was a uh, young man growing up in Moscow before World War II, and if you remember, Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, and about a month after that invasion. Uh, Hitler decided to attack Moscow by air. And he sent these fleets of bombers against Moscow to drop incendiary bombs on the Soviet capital. And a lot of Moscow at the time was built out of wood. And so these bombs set off huge fires. And uh, people in Moscow ran in terror uh, to the subway stations where they felt they were safe. The Moscow subways were deep underground, and it was like an air raid drill. Well... Tolkachev was 14 years old when those bombers hit the city. And one of them set off a huge fire near his home. They ran to the subway station. But the people in Moscow knew from reading Pravda that the city was ringed by huge spotlights. Uh, the Soviets had also very crude radar. Radar was a new technology in the 1930s. But they were really primitive. The Soviet radars were so bad that they couldn't detect the altitude or the velocity of the oncoming German bombers. So in other words, they really didn't have early warning. And the experience of the German bombers, they began the attack in July of 1941 and they continued through the following April. Mm -hmm. So months of this bombing uh, persuaded Stalin and the others that they desperately needed better radar. And, you know, it was a characteristic of the Soviet system when they really needed something, they put their minds to it, they could do it pretty quick. In this case, um, they said, we've got to build better radar. Right. And this decision shaped Tolkachev's life because he went to the equivalent of a high school that was devoted to electronics and radar. That's all he studied. And after that, um, he went off to a technical university and the sort of the equivalent of MIT to study electronics and radar. He, after the war, he was still studying. Finally, um, he comes back to Moscow with this years and years of training, and he's immediately assigned to one of the two major institutes in Moscow building radar. And by this time, the Cold War is underway, and uh, radar is more than just a big old dish on the ground. It's also become very important in air defenses defending the country against attack, and also building radars for the MiG fighters that would be on the front lines of the Cold War in Europe. Right. And Tolkachev had a major role in that through the period of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. He was at the front lines of making the most important radars for Soviet fighters and warplanes, particularly the MiGs. He worked in an institute in Moscow where he... Uh, what became the deputy head of the laboratory. The, you know, so he was a creative, smart guy. But he was burning with anger. And one of the reasons was, at that Radar Institute, he had met his future wife, a young woman named Natasha. He was 30. She was 22. Um, they fell in love. Natasha had had a very, very difficult life. When she was two years old, in the 30s, before the war, her mother had been an official in the Soviet timber ministry, a party official. So she had a top job, and her father was a party official also, and a newspaper editor. He edited a paper for workers in light industry. So they were both part of the establishment. One night, KGB shows up at their apartment, a mile and a half from the Kremlin, and take her mother away. She was accused of subversion, executed. Her father, scared out of his mind, flees to a friend's apartment, hides out for a week, and the KGB grabs him 
accuses him of subversion and sends him to the gulag. Was this in the uh, in the late thirties? Was this the nineteen thirty seven? September yeah. nineteen thirty seven, in the middle of the Great Terror, mm-hmm. Natasha saw her mother taken away in the middle of the night. Her father too. She was two years old. Two years old, she lost her parents. So she grew up uh, until she was a young woman. She grew up until she was eighteen in an orphanage. The purges, the Great Terror, had robbed her of her family life. So when she met Tolkachoff and when they later married, she brought with her a lot of bitterness about what had happened to her family. And I think Tolkachoff himself absorbed a lot of that. Now, I think some of that was ameliorated a little bit in the late 1950s after they were married because the period of the thaw, the Khrushchev thaw comes along. Young people had a lot of optimism in the thaw, or at least Mm -hmm. there was a sense that maybe all the horrors of the past, the war, the purges, Stalin... The sacrifices were over, and things would get better. Um, by the mid-60s, uh, they weren't getting better. Tolkachev and Natasha had a son, Oleg, and he was born in the mid-60s. And I think Tolkachev was really beginning to wonder, are things going to get better or not? And Khrushchev, of course, was ousted in 64. Um, by the early 70s, I think Adolf Tolkachev, still working at this Radar Institute, a place called Phasotron, Mm -hmm. and moving up the ladder and developing better and better radars. Um, And Natasha, who was reading Samus Dot, dissident literature at home, um, you know, privately they were seething about the fact the Soviet system was not getting any better. Tolkachev tried to decide about what to do. How could he express this? anger he was feeling. He did not want to do something right away because he had a young son. He didn't want to deliver to his son the kind of life that Natasha had had. He didn't want anything to happen to the family. But by 1975, 76, you know, his son was 10 years old. He was really burning up and wanted to Mm. express this anger he felt about the failure of the Soviet system, the hypocrisy. So he began to think about what to do. The first thing he thought of was, maybe I'll go out on the street and hand out some pamphlets. And I think in five minutes he realized that he'd probably get arrested, and that wasn't a very good idea. But uh, then he decided, uh, you know, he had to do something. By 1976, I think he was pretty well um, determined to do something to strike back at this system that had angered him so much. And by 76... um, Solzhenitsyn was already a uh, household word. They had actually read some of his works in Samus Dada, and Andrei Sakharov was beginning to speak up for dissidents. And Sakharov himself, like Tolkachev, uh, worked in a secret institute. You have to understand, this radar institute where Tolkachev worked was a very closed place. They did work for the military. Everything was top secret. Um, and I think that Tolkachev took some inspiration from seeing that Sakharov had the courage to speak out about what was wrong in the Soviet system, and uh, that Solzhenitsyn was also an influence. But still, he didn't quite know what to do. One day, September 1976, he's twiddling the dials on his shortwave radio, uh, which he had on the ledge of his ninth-floor apartment in a Moscow high-rise, and he picked up the voice of America. The VOA was sometimes jammed in Moscow, but not always. Mm -hmm. And he picked up a radio news broadcast from VOA, which reported that a Soviet fighter pilot, test pilot, named Viktor Belenko, had flown his MiG-25, a very powerful interceptor, from the middle of an exercise in progress in the Far East. And he'd flown it right out of the Soviet Union to a civilian airport in Japan and landed it in a civilian airport and asked for asylum. Uh, Belenko popped the cockpit when he landed, fired a handgun in the air to ward off any onlookers, and the first Japanese official who approached him, he handed a note which said in English, I want asylum in in America. And he got it. Well, Adolf Tolkachev heard this radio broadcast in his apartment in Moscow, and he was amazed because Tolkachev knew a lot about that plane that Belenko was flying. The radars had been built in his institute. The Americans had wondered what was in that MiG-25. It was one of the most mysterious of the Soviet 
aviation project. It was a terrifying. It was a terrifying fighter at the time, right? Well, we thought it was a terrifying yeah. fighter because it was could reach almost three times the speed of sound, mm -hmm. Mach three. Maybe it was Mach two point eight. It was so fast, and yet we had never seen one actually touched one. And nobody really understood mm -hmm. um, was it the world's fastest fighter or not. So when Belenko defected, the first thing the United States did was to send a team from uh, the U.S. to take it apart, the one that Belenko had flown. By the way, he flew the, one of the latest models they had right. uh, to Japan. They took it apart, and it was an intelligence windfall. Suddenly, we could see what we, the plane really was. And, of course, uh, we learned from taking it apart that while it was very fast, it wasn't a fighter at all. Okay. It was actually just an interceptor. It could fly in a straight line to intercept oncoming planes. It was an air defense interceptor, but it actually had a lot of difficulty maneuvering, especially at uh, low altitude. So when Tolkachev heard this on the radio, he was, had an epiphany. He thought, if this guy, Milenko, could fly a plane and it was so valuable to the Americans, well, I have a lot of that information right in the, my file drawer at the office. And he heard on the radio, whether true or not, that Belenko asked for and got a million dollars. Well, that seemed like a lot of money to Tokachev. And I don't think he wanted a million dollars because he wanted to get rich or he could spend it on anything in Soviet-era Moscow. He couldn't. There wasn't much to buy. But he thought if the Americans are willing to spend a million dollars for this plane that Belenko flew as a defector, mm -hmm. then I have all the same information in my file drawer. I can do the same thing that Belenko did, but I won't fly an airplane out of the country. I can just give this to somebody, and I can hurt the Soviet system that way. Right. I'm going to pause you right now. So, um, I mean, a couple of things. First, uh, for any... That takes him up to the moment where he becomes a spy. Right, right, right. So, um, for anybody who's sort of interested in how the United States acquired MiGs, I, I don't know if you've read a book by Steve Davies called Red Eagles, but it's a really interesting book of, uh, about how... Um, now, to my recollection, I mean, the United States, we weren't able to keep that MiG, right? We could do a ton of stuff with it, but then we put it in a box and sent it back to the, the Soviets, eventually. Yes, we put it in a crate and <laughs> we sent it back on a ship. Yeah. But we were able to take it apart. And we could realize it was built of heavier metals than our planes were. The rivets were rough. It was a very rough, serviceable, fast interceptor, but it was not a fighter. And that was an intelligence windfall. Um, by the way, the radar in that thing, which Tolkachev had worked on, had vacuum tubes. Um, so we, we were able to see right. that Soviets were far behind. And particularly, there was one thing we were very interested in, which is whether or not they had mastered something called look-down, shoot-down radar, which enabled a fighter or an interceptor to see moving objects against Earth underneath the airplane. And against the background of the Earth is oftentimes difficult for conventional radar. And by looking at Belenko's plane, we can see that plane did not have look-down, shoot-down radar. So a big intelligence issue for the United States at the time, one that was unsettled in 1976, is how far along were the Soviets with look-down, shoot-down radar? We and didn't this, really know. And this was absolutely critical because uh, American bomber penetration strategy by that time had was no longer high-level, high-altitude penetration, which became impossible with the, with the Soviet SAM network, but was B-52s and B-52s essentially going at low out, flying at low altitude and low-altitude penetration, which, which would have made much of the Soviet interceptor fleet very... Uh, not entirely useless, perhaps, but very, very uh, at a distinct disadvantage without that kind of radar. Not only that, but the next generation of American strategy um, was to be the air-launched cruise missile or the strategic cruise missile, mm -hmm. which would fly at even lower altitudes than the B-52 under the Soviet radar. So if we were going to send the cruise missiles under the radar and invest billions in developing that cruise missile, um, we would want to know that it would be effective. But we had doubts about the quality of Soviet air defenses in 1976. I've looked at the intelligence reporting and the uh, intelligence products. Um, the thing is that it's not that we did, weren't in possession of some interesting information, but we didn't know how to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. What we found was they had a lot of resources devoted to air defense. They did want to prevent us from 
from crossing their borders. But we, what we couldn't tell is whether or not all those ground control interceptors and all those guys in the uh, ground control and all those pilots and planes, whether it would actually work, because right. it seemed to be rather jury-rigged. The training of the troops seemed to be uh, subpar. There was a school of thought that they had all this stuff, but it might not work very well. But we didn't really know. And if you were planning to shoot a cruise missile under their radars, and if you were going to go to the Congress and go to the defense contractors to build it, you needed some confidence, which we didn't have. No, I read, I read, I read this book at it was a, literally almost by a chapter by chapter at uh, the same time as I read uh, the book on Andrew Marshall by Andrew Kapinovich and um, oh, the other fellow I can't remember his name now. And it was a you know whatever I'm a national security nerd, but it was an enormously productive intellectual exercise, like reading about the intelligence on the one side and then how some of this intelligence filtered into the planning structures uh, within the Pentagon. It was a really Sort of fascinating. So anyway, Tolkachev make he try he's he's at this point where he wants to make contact, and right. this is actually the be, the funnest the most interesting part of the story is like this sort of almost Keystone Cop thing going on with him and the Americans for a while. So it's uh, early 1977, just a week before Jimmy Carter was inaugurated president, and Tolkachev deci has decided that he wants to uh, use some of this really valuable crown jewels information in his file drawer and make contact with somebody. And he, he's decided that it wouldn't do any good to tell the Chinese, and he doesn't want to tell the British or the Canadians, but he decides he wants to tell the Americans. Tolkachev lives in the high-rise apartment building that's a couple blocks from the American embassy, and he's an exercise nut. Three times a week he goes out at 5 or 6 in the morning and runs around, the, uh, gets a lot of jogging exercise, and his route takes him around the American embassy compound. So he's a familiar sight to the guardsmen, the militiamen who stand outside and guard. Um, he's familiar running down that sidewalk in front of the American embassy three times a week. And, but as he's doing this over the years, he notices where the Americans park their cars. Um, the cars have special license plates, which begin with a D-04 at the time. And Tolkachev sees that the Americans sometimes leave the windows cracked open a little bit. Um, he also sees even where they fill up their cars with gasoline. So on January 12, 1977, Tolkachev was hanging out at the gas station where the American diplomats filled up their cars. And he had done two things. He had memorized three sentences in English. He didn't have good English. He had memorized these sentences. And he had written a note, not with his name signed on it, just a note saying, I'm an engineer. I'd like to, to offer my services. So he watched the cars, and he saw a car with D04 in the line at the gas station. The man was filling up the gas, and he was just finishing and getting in to the car when Tolkachev approached him. And the first thing he did was his first sentence, which was, are you an American? The man said, yes. And then Tolkachev used his second sentence, which is, can I talk with you? And the man says, look, it would be rather difficult. There are people waiting behind him and so on. And Tolkachev said, has his third sentence, which is, oh, it would be difficult. He then takes his note and puts it into the car on the passenger seat and disappears. He didn't realize it, but he had just approached the chief of the CIA station in Moscow, Robert Fulton. Mm -hmm. Fulton was the top CIA man there, had been there a while. Um, he immediately drove back to the CIA station. This is the CIA's main office in Moscow, and opened the note. And here was an offer. Um, it also contained some instructions, which if you want to contact me and continue to talk to me, then park your car a certain way at a certain time on a certain street with, facing outward with the headlights on, and that will be a signal and so on. It was sort of elaborate. The man didn't know what to think because the Moscow at the time was swarming, literally swarming with KGB. And the CIA's uh, case officers had to work in very difficult circumstances where they were constantly under surveillance. In fact, they had very few human sources in Moscow because the KGB made it so difficult for them. And at this point, they had a fair amount of concern in the station, and I would say fear back at headquarters, that anybody who volunteered was a dangle, was a trap. And Bob Fulton didn't want to put his foot into a trap. None of the CIA people wanted to go ahead and contact somebody that might be a fake. Mm 
or a dangle or a phony. Now, what was the downside of, uh, like, what, what was the danger of a dangle, right? I mean, is it that you get bad information, that you get sort of thrown out of the country if you, if you make a wrong choice here? I mean, why not just, you know, be pretty risk acceptant with respect to, with respect to these people coming up to you? Well, first of all, the KGB was quite practiced at dangles. They had, mm -hmm. this wasn't a theoretical fear. This was a practical, real-time problem that there have been many mm -hmm. deceptions. And, mm -hmm. <clears throat> for almost 20 years, the head of the CIA's counterintelligence division, um, James Angleton, had warned uh, and of Dangles and actually persuaded many people, not only in his division, but in the Soviet, the so-called SE division, that anybody that came was going to be a KGB Dangle. So the paranoia levels in various offices of the CIA were rather high, which is that, you know, the KGB is on a global effort to deceive us. And you asked what were the dangers. The physical dangers were the following. Mm -hmm. To the agent, to the, to the person who volunteered, um, if he was working for the KGB, probably not very great. But if he was a real uh, spy, someone who would really help you, um, he'd be arrested and accused of treason and killed, executed. Mm -hmm. The dangers to the case officer were that he'd be kicked out of the country. That was standard procedure. If you're caught... Uh, carrying out espionage, you were made a persona non grata, PNG, and kicked out of the country. Further dangers were that if you accepted the dangle, began to work with him, and his information was fake, phony, it could be disinformation, it could be misleading, if you were trying to base a $10 billion cruise missile program on espionage information and, and the specs were wrong, it was fake, then you could make a huge miscalculation. Nobody wanted to do that. Right. So the, the dangers of uh, making an error on the street here were high, but at the same time, um, Bob Fulton was an experienced guy, and he had some kind of inkling that this guy maybe wasn't a dangle. So right away, uh, he followed the instructions and went out there and parked his car, and he also, by the way, sent a cable to Moscow. And in my book, uh, The Billion Dollar Spy, on the, in the first uh, opening a, a pay, uh, end paper of the book, I reprint this cable so everybody can see exactly what it was that Fulton told headquarters and said, look, I've had this guy, he approached me, here's what he looked like, and so on. But while that cable was going to headquarters, Fulton actually went out there and sent the signal by parking his car, and the guy didn't show. There was nothing to be seen. So he came back to the station. Mm -hmm. And when he got back, there was a note from headquarters saying, could be a dangle. Don't contact him. But Fulton told me before he died that he had actually gone out and made the effort because he uh -huh. thought maybe by gut feeling that this guy was for real. But uh, after that, he followed uh, headquarters instructions and didn't contact him. And Tolkachev, having sent this first note, was a very determined fellow. As I explained, he had spent many years thinking about um, what he was about to do. He was very determined and very angry. He had this sort of burning desire to do the maximum damage to the Soviet system that he could as an individual, possessing their secrets. So he continued to try and contact the CIA. Uh, he approached Fulton four more times in the following Now, month. do we know why he didn't show up the, that, the time where he had initially given the signal? I don't, I don't remember what you had... Uh, in that very first signal, we don't know why. Right. Maybe he was there and Fulton didn't see him, but right. Fulton parked his car and followed the instruction and came back and nothing, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. There are parts of the story that, uh, even though I worked on the book for a couple of years, are unknown. So, so here we are in 1977, Jimmy Carter's become president of the United States. He's very uh, hopeful and a bit naive about the Soviets, but he wants to start a big nuclear arms reduction process, and he's... Uh, Certainly not interested in having a big kerfuffle in Moscow over a spy. Mm -hmm. Also, there were a series of very discouraging um, moves that had happened in Moscow with the CIA, including uh, agents who were rolled up at a fire in the Moscow embassy where the station was located. And uh, Stansfield Turner, who was an admiral, became director of the CIA under Jimmy Carter, ha was so worried about these anomalies that were occurring in the Moscow station. A again, the fire was actually in the political section, the floor above the station, but when the firemen responded to the fire in Moscow, mm -hmm. um, 
the CIA people believe that the first wave of them were actually KGB men hoping to break into the station. And they were barred from breaking into the station by the man who was then the station chief. His name was Gus Hathaway. And he was a sort of a legendary station chief, um, received an award from the CIA mm -hmm. for barring the KGB from entering the station that day. So Stansfield Turner ordered the Moscow station to stand down to stop all espionage activity. Um, Turner had his reasons. He was worried about all these anomalies, but it was quite unusual in the Cold War. I don't know of any other moment when Moscow Station, you know, the station in the heart of the enemy, was ordered to stop espionage operations. Mm -hmm. And this happened right at the time that Adolf Tolkachev, this radar designer with all these secrets in his file drawer, was knocking on their door, and not just once. Four times, five times. So through 77, uh, during the stand-down, the CIA didn't respond, and Tolkachev kept trying. Then he went away for six months on a business trip to design some radars. It came back. It was near about Christmas time, 19, and finally he started to monitor all those cars again with the D04 license plates, and suddenly he saw an American at a market. This market was not far from his house and the embassy, and it wasn't the uh, same car he had seen before, but he had a letter written, a more detailed letter. He went up and gave it to the man. It turned out he had approached the major domo of Spasso House, which is the ambassador's residence. Mm -hmm. And that man, of course, got that letter pretty quick to CIA head station. And again, this time Tokachev was more forthcoming. Um, one thing led to another. He again, he, one time he approached Hathaway the following February on the... Mm -hmm. A street corner, he had banged on the window of his car when Hathaway was pulling out. Hathaway's wife rolled down the window and Polkatov shoved an envelope through the, through the window. That envelope contained what they were waiting for. It contained a message that said, I am Adolf Tolkachev. Here's my phone number. Here's what I am. Here's where I work. I want to cooperate with you. Mm -hmm. So by early 78, the gears finally are in motion. It's more than a year after Tolkachev first approached them. And it takes a while to make further contact with them. An espionage operation is finally begun on New Year's Day, 1979, almost two years after Tolkachev approached the CIA. And then that operation, which began on that New Year's Day, 79, led to 21 meetings with Tolkachev on the streets of Moscow. Most of those meetings in parks, in courtyards, on street corners, were carried out within three miles of the front door of KGB headquarters. So, I mean, let's. I want to fast forward a little bit here because um, there is so much interesting information in the book about 1980s spycraft and all that, but we want people to buy the book. So, I mean, there's a ton of stuff like that you go into with respect to the cameras that are sent. I mean, like the details of the cameras are extremely Im important in this case because it's literally the stuff that Tolkachev is trying to move in and he has to get the lighting right in the bathroom and there's not enough light, not enough candles, and he has to try all this again. Um, um, but before we talk about what happened to Tol Tolkachev, what kind of impact did the information that he started pouring into the United States, what kind of impact did that have on, on like, the U.S. approach? I mean, that, he's called the billion-dollar spy because he, 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 his information changed how we did some of our defensive stuff. Like, wh what was some of that stuff that changed? As I mentioned before, we had a lot of uncertainty about Soviet air defenses. This is sort of the forgotten dimension of that late Cold War competition. You know, a lot of people pay attention to, you know, intercontinental ballistic missiles, strategic nuclear issues, but air defenses was a really big part of it. And in fact, in 1976, when we had the famous Team A, Team B competitive analysis exercise in intelligence, um, in addition to Soviet intentions and Soviet military capabilities, the third area of discussion with Soviet air defenses. And from that discussion, you can see we still didn't know whether or not they could stop. How The real issue was how low could they detect uh, low-flying. And this, of course, becomes an important question for Tolkachev. It's the main question that we have, which is uh, at the time, 1977, we're already beginning flight trials. There was a competition to build that strategic cruise missile, and there were two defense contractors building separate one. So we need to know, 
Tolkachev mm -hmm. confirms um, in the first year and a half that the Soviets are just beginning, just beginning to think about how to cope with the st strategic cruise missile, that low-flying, air-breathing, uh, nuclear-capable threat. And the Soviet air defenses were pretty good at high levels, as you mentioned, the surface-to-air missiles, but they actually weren't very good under a certain ceiling. I don't know the exact number, but maybe, you know, 900 feet, 1,000 feet, mm -hmm. a couple hundred meters. They couldn't see something. So this was really important for the United States to know that if we were going to have a cruise missile that could hug terrain at 100 feet altitude, it would get through. And there was a moment Tokachev was photographing secret documents, mostly um, in the early stages of the operation, through most of it, using a Pentax ME 35 millimeter film camera, single lens reflex, a simple camera that was made by the millions would not be out of order around the neck of any tourist anywhere in the world, and certainly not extraordinary in the Soviet Union. Um, one night in 1980, he met his case officer, a man named John Gilcher, his first case officer, and Tolkachev had 179 rolls of film to give him in a briefcase. And I reproduce in the book some of the memos that were generated from that, but one of them was um, the really important intelligence about the state of Soviet air defenses, and therefore information that could be programmed into the United States countermeasures, both um, Soviet air defenses on the ground, the radars that protected the country and their capabilities, and Soviet radars and their warplanes that would be used in any conflict in Europe, any Cold War conflict, if there were Cold War turned hot in Europe, mm -hmm. and also the, the whole question of Soviet air defense planes, whether they could see um, either our bombers or our cruise missiles underneath the radar. And some of this, I mean, some of this has, has outlasted the Cold War in some sense, right? I mean, knowing how um, Soviet interceptors, knowing how they see the world and how they can see the world and what they inform their pilots about um, was also relevant in places like Iraq and other places where we, where we flew against MiGs, right? Yeah, so, and, and in the a, book, a longer term thing. In the book, I provide an appendix which discusses that because mm -hmm. uh, long after the Cold War, we, um, we were able to intercept their communications to their MiGs from their AWACS. Uh, we understood how the radars worked. I assume that today, in 2016, um, the Russians and Soviets have rebuilt these things, and maybe the information isn't as valuable today. But I talked to people that were working on the information Tolkachev provided well into the 1990s. So we get to Tolkachev's end, and... Um you know, we go through the. Or we can you you can, or we can wait for people to read the book to go through the story of what happens to him. Um, what happens? I guess what happens to him, and what happens to his family? Right. I know that there's some question about what happens to his family, and I know that now. I mean, some people I've talked about this who are familiar with it from the Russian side do not view Tolkachev as an anti-Soviet hero or anything along those lines. I mean, they still seem to view Tolkachev as a traitor. So, or at least some people that I've talked to. Um, but um, so, what happens to him, and what happens to his family down the line? Well, Tolkachev provided tens of thousands of pages of uh, really valuable intelligence over six years. Um, I don't want to give away what happens in the book, but he was betrayed. Um, he was not caught on the streets of Moscow um, meeting with the CIA. Those meetings happened. Uh, with an incredible amount of care mm -hmm. and superior tradecraft for the time. But he was betrayed by a fired CIA trainee, a man who was trying to get his revenge on the CIA and went to the Soviets. Um, that betrayal is a story I tell in the book. I won't mm -hmm. belabor. But after he was betrayed, Tolkachev was arrested. Um, he was tried by a military tribunal, accused of treason, and sentenced to death. And he was executed in 1986. Um, we know that uh, this happened because there is some video that the KGB has sp subsequently made public mm -hmm. of the actual verdict. And also, I, uh, in the paperback edition of this book, which will be out in a couple of months, I reproduced the 
minutes of a Politburo meeting the day after the sentence was carried out, in which Mikhail Gorbachev was told by his KGB chief that Tokachev's execution was the day before. Um, and both the KGB man and Gorbachev comment on how valuable the information he gave away was to the Americans. So from the point of view of the Soviet state at the time, Tokachev was a traitor. He was a uh, spy. He did commit espionage. Um, he did it for the United States. He did it out of some deep, deep anger about what had happened to his family and what had happened to the Soviet system. Um, Tokachev didn't spy because he loved America. Mm -hmm. He told the CIA in a letter, you know, he did not have enough fantasy or romanticism um, to fall in love with America, a place he had never been. But he spied out of a deep anger at what had happened to his own country. So um, uh, I'm not sure you're aware of this, and I know we talked a little bit about it before. A few years ago, there was a, 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 a CIA historian who claimed that Tolkachev was a dangle. Um, but, I mean, th th that has been, and I know he's still making these claims, and I think his name is Ben Fisher. I mean, that has pretty much been entirely put to bed, right, especially by the information we now have from the Polar Bureau and all this stuff, right? It would have to be an enormous conspiracy to have Gorbachev having talked about this in a Polar Bureau meeting. Tolkachev was not a dangle. Tolkachev was a real agent who risked his life and eventually paid with his life for what he believed in, which, as he told the CIA over and over again, his goal was to do the maximum damage in the shortest period of time to the Soviet system. Uh, his original plan, when he met his first case officer, was to do it over uh, many years in a series of stages, all of which he overfulfilled. <laughs> much quicker. He emptied the vaults of Soviet military industrial research and development years before he thought he would. He was so enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. They tried to slow him down. The book describes repeated concerns at CIA headquarters and in the Moscow station that Tolkachev was overdoing it. He was taking too much. He was moving too fast. He wouldn't slow down. Um, so, you know, looking forward, this, this all happened... 30 years ago now. Oh, but um, one more thing. Oh, go ahead. If, there's just no question if you look at the quality of the product, the positive intelligence that Tolkachev provided, there's just no question in my mind that um, if he was a dangler or a fake or a trap, that the KGB and nobody in the Soviet system would have let out this kind of really valuable intelligence mm -hmm. just to run a dangle against the CIA. It's far too valuable information about Soviet research intentions 10 years in the future. Right. You don't give that stuff away when you're running a dang. Um, so we're 30 years down the road now, and uh, you know a lot of stuff with the cameras and the, and the spy craft and so forth um, is really quite quaint from the perspective of where we are in 2016, right, with the ability to transfer just gigantic amounts of information in incredibly small. I mean, I, I suspect you could fit almost everything that Tolkachev sent. You could fit that on one thumb drive. Um, I mean, maybe that might be a little bit of a... a no, it's not. There's a thumb drive that has everything Tolkachev sent. <laughs> right. So, you know, what does, I guess, for, and this is extremely speculative, but, but, you know, what does the next Tolkachev look like? Does he look like someone like Snowden who, you know, puts all of this in an encrypted thumb drive, you know, from the Chinese Ministry of Defense or out of the PLA and, you know, drops it in a small envelope and then sends it along, right? I mean, how does that change how we think about industrial espionage, all the technology, how the well, technology First of all, I, I don't think we're talking about industrial espionage. We're mm -hmm. talking about national security espionage, okay? Okay. Uh, industrial espionage is when people steal things from companies, like when uh, you know a foreign electronics company tries to steal an iPhone design. That's industrial espionage. What Tolkachev did was uh, espionage in which there was a giant conflict between two blocks. It was an existential conflict, the Cold War, between the Soviet bloc and the West. And it was very much uh, because... These two giant systems were in conflict in their basic values and mm -hmm. their basic sort of sense of the world. And so uh, what Tokachev did was a, a really courageous thing in the analog era. Mm -hmm. It was the era of chemical-based photography, right? Photography was based on film, which had silver halide in it. Um, it was the era of telephones with cords and all, all of the things that you can read about and remember from the analog era. Mm -hmm. 
In the digital era we're in today, it's unimaginably different. Um, and I think that espionage today certainly still goes on for national security reasons. Instead of two big blocks, we have a messier world. Uh, but I would suspect that to, as we sit here, the CIA would love to have a man of Tolkachev's convictions inside ISIS, inside North Korea. Definitely we've had some inside Iran, mm -hmm. and not to mention China and a few other places. So the real relevance of Tolkachev's story to us today is not the tradecraft, because the tradecraft is already, as you say, quaint and it's passed from the analog era to the digital era. But the relevance is, even in this digital era that we're in, even in this time of great technical accomplishments when we can listen in on cell phone conversations, tap into others' email, uh, you know, get petabytes of, of data, we still need human source intelligence. Mm -hmm. There are things which people can do for you and tell you about what's going on in the system that you can't get from satellites, that you can't get from signals intelligence, that you can't get from emails. And Tolkachev, the lesson here is that when there are things in a vault or in people's minds, um, when they are talking about things just about their intentions, they don't always write it down. It's not always possible to read it from a standoff. So if there's a Tolkachev inside some of our adversaries today, mm -hmm. we need that kind of human source intelligence. It has not changed. <laughs> Well, David, this has been a fantastic conversation, and thank you so much. You want to hold up the book again so that... Uh, it's well, the book's called The Billion Dollar Spy. It'll be out in paperback in a little while, and uh, I hope people will like it. I hope right. they get a chance to read it. All right, well, fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us, and uh, viewers of Foreign Entanglements, thank you again for, for watching. Thanks for having me. All right. All right, fantastic.